I'm Ramis Mabasa. I'll be talking about quantum supremacy and hardness of estimating output properties of quantum circuits. This is a joint work of Ryuhei Mori and Yasuhiro Kondo. Um, these are the two references. KMM21 is indeed the Spock stock with the same title. And some of the previous work that will be used are in this paper that I'll refer to as MOVE20, random circuits and quantum supremacy. So now that quantum computers have arrived, the question that has been in the field is, are these capable of performing computational tasks that are practically impossible on any classical computer? And if one could show an exponential separation between the power of quantum computers and classical computers, this would refute the long-standing extended church Turing thesis, which basically says anything that happens in nature, you can compute in polynomial time on a Turing machine. So the main the coin uh, the term was coined by John Preskill, quantum supremacy, and the main candidates we have today are boson sampling, IQP circuits, which are a restricted model of quantum computation, and the encompassing model called random circuit sampling, which is what Google focused on recently, and indeed is the lead candidate. They, Google demonstrated an experimental result for the sampling task on 53 qubit device, but and they made a claim that. Uh, this task would take 10,000 years on any classical computer or supercomputer. However, the task did not have a proof. So we didn't provably know. We believe that random circuit sampling would be hard on a classical computer, but there was not a proof. We still don't quite have it. So soon people started challenging the 10,000 years and the most up-to-date work can perform what Google did on 53 qubit device in five minutes and four seconds flat. So this begs the question, is the task of random circuit sampling even hard? Maybe the claim was not quite correct. I believe it is correct. Um, now, quantum complexity is mostly about asymptotic behavior with N, not like 53 or, you know, 45 or whatever. Um, so you have to really see how things scale asymptotically. And most of these classical algorithms that use high performance computing techniques um, are actually exponential time algorithms. Um, so, today I'll talk about the complexity of random circuit sampling to, you know, try to justify or perhaps challenge whether the task is actually hard, theoretically. Is there a point to doing such experiments to, you know, eventually overturn the extended church turing thesis? So, what is the problem? So, this is a circuit in quantum computation time runs on the horizontal axis. And without specifying the actual one or two qubit gates, this is called an architecture. So these are the qubits, this is time, and this is an architecture blueprint where the gates would go. And once you instantiate the gates, so this becomes an X, Z, or a C naught, or what have you, so with the total number of gates being M throughout this talk, and little n being the number of qubits, this becomes a quantum circuit. Now we say quantum circuit is random, fully random, we actually call it hard random with respect to the architecture A, if every one of the gates is independently drawn respect to hard measure from the space of unitaries. Gates are unitary always, so uniformly at random, you pick each one of the gates and independently. And like most computational tasks, we start with all zeros, run the circuit, make measurements. So you perform basically a random algorithm. And the goal is to prove that sampling from the output distribution of this quantum circuit, which you can just run in the lab, uh, would be very hard to replicate on a classical computer. So there is the supremacy conjecture says there is no classical randomized algorithm that can perform random circuit sampling efficiently. But how do you prove such a thing? Well, there is a celebrated Stock Myers algorithm that says if there exists a classical randomized algorithm that efficiently gave samples from the output distribution, then you could efficiently estimate the probabilities. Here, efficiently means in polynomial time, and estimating is something very particular that I'll talk about on the next slide. Now. In this earlier work, MOV20, um, the conversation was changed by looking at the contrapositive statement. So instead of trying to prove the actual sampling hardness, you can focus on the hardness of estimating probabilities. So some quantifiable fine, fine grain analysis of hardness of probabilities. So the contrapositive says that if estimating probabilities is hard, then classical sampling is hard by stock marriage reduction. So the problem statement is that you have an architecture A, and you can run this random circuit C starting from all zero state, you run C, and the probability amplitude of measuring the bit string X, you wanna prove this is hard for average case circuits. 
And by hard, we mean Sharpie hard, which as you know, is even harder than MP because like the counting version. And as a matter of fact, estimating is the key word. Um, and one other thing I'd like to say is that because of the so-called hiding property, it's sufficient to prove the hardness of measuring the all zero string. So by estimating, one means that you, so here, this point P0 was proved to be hard in MOVE 20, but what is really needed is that you want to extend that hardness to a full neighborhood. So you want to show that there is a neighborhood of very particular size shown here for which the result, the hardness extends. So any point estimating to within any neighborhood here remains hard. We don't have that yet. Nobody has that yet, but the best we have, I mean, the first work, I could prove something close, but the best we have now is a more, is a wider region, which does not still include the full uh, needed region, but I'll talk about it today. So to summarize, theorem one of our work says that it is sharply hard under a BP reduction, BPP reduction to approximate that probability with a very high probability. So one minus negligible in the number of gates for the average choice of circuits to within the additive error of two to the minus big omega of M log M. A theorem two basically uses a weaker oracle, but needs to assume a stronger uh, classical reduction. So BPP to the MP machine is needed. So the success probability goes from almost one to a constant. And I remind you, M is the number of gates. And in practice, if you have a constant depth circuit, this means that we can prove to a neighborhood epsilon of two to the minus N log N. And remember that we want a two to the minus N essentially. And for the Google type circuits where the depth is root N, so you have a grid of root N by root N, N qubits. So it's a two dimensional architecture and the depth is root N then epsilon is two to the minus O of n to the three halves log n. So we don't quite have it yet, but we're getting close. And what is, so we could also extend the proof to the class of IQP circuits, so same proof. Um, IQP circuits are restricted model of computation, they're not universal. So you start with a layer of Hadamards, and then you have a set of gates that are fully diagonal in the computational basis or in the Z basis. Uh, it could be a local circuit. I put all of it under one big unitary because products of unitary is unitary. And then you apply another layer of Hadamards and you make measurements. What, they, what is perhaps surprising is that the proof also extends to any open neighborhood of a fixed circuit. So um, in particular, if you have, if you consider Clifford circuits for which by grottesman keneal theorem, we know that they're in P, they can be, uh, the exact Clifford circuits can be uh, simulated in P on classical computers. Uh, but if you consider neighborhoods of them, as the proof structure will show in a minute, um, including the all trivial circuit C being the identity circuit, the, 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 the probability amplitudes remain to be hard to estimate to, to, to the minus M log N. And that's perhaps surprising and very interesting to me. So average case hardness, how does it work? Um, the idea is that you want to reduce the worst case circuit hardness. So there exists some circuits for which they're very contrived. We have sharply hardness results. You want to deform the gates, find a path, a parameterized path for respect to theta that takes you from worst case to average case, and then use that hopefully to reduce the worst case hardness to average case. But let me tell you how that works. I think the original idea goes back to Lipton um, suppose for the sake of argument, I haven't told you what the, the what kind of a path to choose. Um, and suppose for the sake of argument, I can construct a path that would result in the probability being a polynomial of low degree. It just happens that, you know, we get a polynomial of low degree. Actually, in this original work, MOVE 20, I showed that actually polynomials are not sufficient. We need to use rational functions, and as you'll see in a second. But it helps the gist of the reduction remains intact. So I want to focus on uh, polynomials for now. Now, and the deformation by construction suppose has the structure that at zero is the sharply hard known worst case circuit, and theta equals one corresponds to a totally random circuit, um, where this neighborhood can be negligibly small, this width. Now, on the way of contradiction, uh, you say, Assume there exists a classical algorithm O 
that can calculate P0 of theta with high probability. And if that is the case, and the degree of the polynomial is D, well, if you call the algorithm O D plus one times, you can write down the polynomial exactly and efficiently because the degree was low. Well, if that's the case, then you can extrapolate to B0 of, at the point zero, which is, a, which is a Sharpie hard quantity, and solve a Sharpie hard problem. So all these steps were efficient, poly n, and we just solved something that was in sharp P. That was sharp P hard. Um, that either means the polynomial hierarchy collapsed to finite level, or we conclude that there does not exist uh, any classical algorithm O that can efficiently calculate P0 of theta for average case circuits. And I remind you that we have we want to prove that there exists a tolerance robustness. So what you really need is to apply that proof and deduce that even if uh, P, you call classical algorithm O and you give it P of theta plus minus epsilon, then the reduction remains intact. So for that, you would, you would need to show that the polynomial extrapolation to point zero lands in a Sharpie heart region. Indeed, in this paper, we could prove that for any Sharpie heart um, circuit family, this point has a neighborhood of two to the minus m to the c for any constant c, and this whole neighborhood remains sharply hard. And this will determine that what kind of a what kind of errors we can tolerate for average case circuits. So I told you polynomials are not good enough, and that's why Cayley path was introduced in this earlier paper, which is essentially a bijection. This is the Cayley function. It's a bijection between the real line and the unit circle in the complex plane. And if you have, suppose, a random Haar unitary H of size n, n, capital N, capital N being two or four, say, four by four or two by two, then there exists a self-adjoint um, little h for which capital H equals f of little h. So the procedure is that we know there's a worst case circuit with m gates, c1 to cm. We can generate uh, very efficiently m corresponding random Haar gates and then we define the path CK of theta to be the worst case gate CK. So this is the kth gate times F of theta HK. Now it is easy to see uh, using some algebra that every entry of this gate will be a rational function of degree NN. That is the numerator is a polynomial of degree capital N and denominator is a polynomial of degree capital N where capital N is the size of the local gate. So it's two or four. So therefore, the deformation is such that the gates that every one of the gates are replaced by this Cayley path deformation. And at theta equals zero, f of zero is identity. And you simply get the worst case circuit, CK. And at theta equals one, you have CK times H of K, which is a Haar random gate. And that's by translation invariance of the Haar measure. And by construction, one will see that the entries of the full circuit will be rational functions of type MN, MN. And this is just to emphasize that the Cayley path is applied to each one of the gates independently. So the probability amplitude then as a result of this squaring will be a rational function of degree 2MN, 2MN. Now I'd like to uh, mention that the proof techniques in this Fox uh, paper uh, veered away from the traditional way of proving things. So we do not use Berlick and Welch algorithm, uh, nor do we use Rachmanov. So we gave first principle and simple lucid proofs for the claims. Um, but in this earlier work, some results that may be of independent interest, in addition to uh, finding in a rational value uh, path that's fully unitary for any theta based on the Cayley function, other results were proved that may be of independent interest. For example, the Berlick and Welch algorithm uh, was generalized from polynomials to rational functions, which was used in this earlier work, but not needed in the current uh, results. So let me summarize the status of quantum supremacy so far. Um, what we have for our task is that in both, so they're both on sampling IQP circuits and random circuit sampling. Um, so experimentally, they all can have been done for some finite sizes. Only random circuit sampling is a universal model. The worst case hardness is known for all of them. Approximate 
worst case hardness, uh, we proved, for example, uh, that two to the minus M to the power C for IQP circuits and random circuit sampling, the average case hardness, the exact average case was proved uh, for uh, for the random circuit sampling in the in this work previously, and was extended to IQP circuits in this work, and the new result that we just heard, and the near exact average case, this is the tolerance to two to the minus m log m, was proved by us and also our colleagues Bulon, Pepperman, Landau, and Liu, which will be the which we'll talk about it in the next talk. Now the different this is a so they obtained similar results as our theorem two in the paper. Um, they were they managed to prove using the traditional techniques like Berlick and Welch and other things that uh, previously were used. So they were able to extend and prove the robustness using those techniques. We found alternative proofs to those, so entirely new set of techniques that we believe are somewhat simpler and perhaps maybe you know helpful for other reasons as well. And the actual quantum supremacy conjecture remains open because we do not have the tolerance that we need. So some open problems are, you know, can you use Cayley path for quantum computing by interpolation? Maybe other things like circuit obfuscation, because it gives you a way to relate a known circuit to some randomized circuit. Um, maybe one can study the power of quantum computers as a function of architecture, delegation of quantum computation. Um, for other cryptographic protocols, circuit hiding, blind quantum computing, or garbled quantum circuits. Can one find proofs that are not based on interpolation using Lipton's uh, ideas? So we indeed, have, we indeed feel that random quantum circuits like to have an exponential advantage over classical circuits and are a good candidate for returning the extended church Turing thesis. And they're also practical in the sense that they, they have some robustness towards imperfection and gate implementation by the virtue of being random. And Cayley path shows that, you know, the hardness is not so much due to the particular set of gates, but it's actually a function of the architecture. And with randomness comes generosity. So the power extends to almost all circuits. Until now, it was believed that, you know, random quantum circuits are only useful for this quantum supremacy tasks, and they're not really useful for any other thing. Let me just give you a preview that um, I'm a long and uh, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in the power of randomness. Uh, I will not get into it, but in classical um, uh, computer, theoretical computer science, probabilistic constructions, cryptography, even in mathematics, you know, zeros of zeta function and Riemann hypothesis follow random matrix theory um, distributions and generosity arguments. And I invite you to look at Avi Wigderson's uh, uh, Abel Prize lecture, a beautiful lecture on randomness and pseudo randomness, where he really shows you know, how randomness is useful in all sorts of things. So then you ask, well, you know, it would be great if we could actually use random quantum circuits in real applications. Let me just showcase that indeed in quantum cryptography very recently, we we're able to use random quantum circuits uh, to propose the so-called quantum Merkle trees. And we could also recently show, um, so the previous work was with Li Ji Chen, and more recently with Oles Stenko, uh, we proved that algorithms were pre we proved that you could use random circuits I came up with two algorithms for preparing Gibbs states on noiseless and noisy random quantum circuits. With this, I salute you for your interest and attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk, and you're always welcome to reach out to me and ask questions if you have any. Thank you.